Good morning and welcome everyone. I'm Sue Desmond Hellman, the current chancellor here at UCSF. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you to such a special symposium. Um, let me start by just posing a question. How on earth could you get Mike Bishop to agree to a celebration of serving 11 years as chancellor? The answer to the question is have Bruce Alberts suggest a great science symposium. So here we are. It is impossible for me in a couple of minutes without stealing time from our distinguished speakers to articulate just what a great legacy Mike has as 11 years chancellor at UCSF. So I'm gonna give you a top 10 list in the uh, style of David Letterman. Think of this as the 11 years of Mike Bishop as chancellor. Establishing UCSF's medical center under new leadership after the merger with Stanford, no small task. This amazing Mission Bay campus developed. The first new research building to be constructed at Parnassus Heights in more than 40 years, the stem cell building. Record-setting fundraising campaign, 1.7 billion, triple the number from the previous campaign. A major initiative on diversity and specifically on behalf of female faculty. The campus reached an all-time high in NIH funding. A major augmentation in the public art at the major campus sites, 1% of all new construction costs. Launching QB3, the quantitative biology initiative, creating an unprecedented multi-campus interdisciplinary collaboration, initiating a major campus-wide initiative on behalf of diversity with annual town hall reports from leadership, and number 10, initiating a vigorous campus-wide program in global health, and as we'll see soon, continuing to bear fruit in that way. So the most important thing for our campus is in fact, Mike is retired as chancellor, but not retired as a faculty member and leader in science. And so I can think of no better way than the wonderful program that we have uh, today to celebrate Mike's leadership, not only as chancellor, but as a leader in science. So the theme of our symposium, Critical Unsolved Problems in Biomedicine, will allow us to explore several issues that were top among uh, Mike's priorities, both as a leader and a scientist at UCSF. In our session on cancer, we'll uh, ask the question, how do we prevent metastasis? No small question. In neuroscience, we'll consider how the brain represents the outside world. And our session on cell biology will include an examination of how cells make decisions. So we have a great program, and so I'm not gonna give a big speech. Um, but I did want to say personally how inspiring Mike's chancellorship has been to me and I know to all of you, his leadership, his wisdom served the campus so well. And so uh, I want to take a moment to pause and just to lend your applause and my thanks and congratulations to Mike on an absolutely fantastic 11 years. <laughs> So thank you, Mike, and, and to begin, I'd like to welcome another distinguished former chancellor, uh, Haile DeBoss, who is, remains a big leader and a big presence on campus, and not only is he a leader in surgery, in medicine, uh, as former dean and former chancellor, he now is our distinguished leader of the global health efforts on campus, and, and he's somebody who I can always count on for a great hug which is, is really good news when you're the new <laughs> chancellor. So, <laughs> thanks, Hailey. Um, Hailey's gonna lead our introductory discussion of a fundamental global health issue that continues to elude us. Can we eradicate malaria? Hailey. Thank you, Sue. Good morning, everybody. I feel truly privileged to participate in this symposium that honors my friend, Mike Bishop. 
several people will be speaking on different facets of his life. He doesn't know this. Uh, I will co I'll confine my remarks on two incidents between Mike and me that changed our respective careers. Dean Rudy Schmidt recruited me in 1987 as chair of the Department of Surgery. He knew I did not want to come. So he did a very curious thing. The guests for the first retirement, for the first recruitment dinner were not members of, of the surgery department or even of the gastroenterology division. They were basic sciences. The likes of Mike Bishop, Bruce Albers, Ira Herskowitz, Zach Hall, Henry Bourne, Keith Yamamoto, and so on. I, I, this was bewildering to me. But soon I was struck by how much they all enjoyed each other's company. I was struck by their wit and by how easily they accepted a surgeon into their company when the general perception is that surgeons think only from the elbow down. <laughs> so it took me only a few minutes to overcome my anxiety and reticence. The evening was a great success. I was hooked and made up my mind to come to UCSF even before I met a single member of the Department of Surgery. So Mike, you and your basic science colleagues had everything to do with my coming to UCSF. Ten years later, I decided to get even with him. I urged and pleaded with him to take the UCSF chancellorship. My argument was that because of the UCSF Stanford clinical merger that was completed a year earlier, he would no longer have to worry about running the hospital. <laughs> In fact, the job of the chancellor is merely to be an academic leader. How wrong I was. The year after he became chancellor, the UCSF Stan Stanford merger started to come apart in a hospital now bankrupt, fractured, and without any of its senior leadership, was thrown back on his lap. Here, Mike, see what you can do with this mess. At first, he did not know what hit him. But Mike is a quick study and rapidly developed, developed a working knowledge of the complex and vexed healthcare system of hospital administration and hospital financing. In the absence of, a medical, of medical center leadership, Mike had to run the hospital with the help of a consulting firm. But then he recruited one of the most talented hospital directors in the country, Mark Claret, and together they pulled us out of the clinical abyss. Mike, uh, UCSF owes you a tremendous debt of gratitude. Under your leader leadership, the UCSF Medical Center not only recovered, but went on to become one among the 10 best hospitals in the country and returned to a strong financial performance. We have enjoyed 11 years of your visionary leadership even though you're a mere basic scientist, you managed to save the UCSF clinical enterprise. On your watch, the already stellar scientific achievement of the UCSF faculty grew even brighter. The Mission Bay campus will be your legacy. And you created UCSF Global Health Sciences. On a personal note, I hope you have forgiven me for persuading you to be the eighth UCSF Chancellor 
and for handing to you, for handing off to you a fractured medical center and the agony that accompanied the demerger. I'm privileged to be your friend and over the 23 years I have been at UCSF, you have inspired me with your scholarship, your eloquence, your sense of history, of literature, and of the arts. Thank you very much, Mike. <laughs> now to the symposium. Mike, relax. It's okay. Sorry. <laughs> As the creator of UCSF Global Health Sciences, it's appropriate that Mike is honored by a session that discusses the critical unsolved problem in global health, namely the eradication of malaria. In 2008 alone, 250 million people con uh, were afflicted with malaria, and 1 million children died from it. We remain without any highly effective vaccine, and the most powerful artemisinin-based combination therapies, or ACTs, are threatened by the emergence of resistance at the Thai-Cambodian border. What is of great concern is that we do not have a plan B. The race to develop vaccines some design to block transmission continues, but as for now, we have, all we have are incompletely effective vaccines. We are pleased this morning to have Dr. Christopher Plough as our keynote speaker for this session. He's professor of medicine, epidemiology, microbiology, immunology, and immunology at the University of Maryland. He's chief of, Mala of the malaria section. He's the Doris Duke Distinguished uh, Clinical Scientist and a Howard Hughes Medical Investigator. He is known for his work on malaria drug resistance, molecular epidemiology, molecular evolution, pathogenesis, HIV malaria interactions, and clinical trials on malaria drugs and vaccine. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Plough. Chris. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it is indeed a real honor to uh, be here to talk to you uh, in such a lovely auditorium, such a lovely campus. I have a bit of campus envy right now coming from downtown Baltimore. But uh, uh, you could have given me an easier question to answer, uh, but I'll, I'll try to do my best here. Um, so I've, I've been asked to talk about whether or not we can eradicate malaria, and I'll just give you just a, a bit of background. Malaria, I hope most of you know, is a parasitic infection transmitted by mosquitoes, and it passes relatively quickly without causing any problems uh, through your liver, and it gets into your red blood cells. And what you can see here are uninfected cells and uh, an infected cell, and the parasite has just taken over the machinery of the cell. It's expressing its own cytoadherence proteins there, and these sticky parasites, in the case of Plasmodium falciparum, the, the worst of the human malarias, can stick in the brain and other tissues and, and cause swelling. You can see here in hemorrhages, and this is a little child in Malawi who, uh, despite the wide open eyes, is in a deep coma from cerebral malaria. So it's, it's a bad disease. As you just heard, the numbers are big. Uh, those numbers, um, Dr. DeBoss just mentioned add up to about 100 deaths an hour. Uh, and this is a child in the morgue at Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital who died of cerebral malaria uh, in Malawi. But it's a curable disease and it's preventable. This is a little child also in Malawi who uh, received chloroquine, this old drug that had failed in Africa, but once uh, it was taken out of Malawi, began to work again. And she perked up with uh, 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 one dose of chloroquine overnight and uh, is playing with her, her doll there. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a disease that uh, there's reason to be optimistic we can do something about. So before I go any further, I want to give a few definitions. Uh, we're, we're talking about eradication, but um, for the last several decades, we've been thinking about malaria mainly in terms of control, which the World Health Organization defines as reduction of disease incidence and burden to the point where it's no longer a significant public health priority. 
uh, elimination. There's a lot of work at UCSF uh, uh, thinking about and, and uh, planning for elimination means the interruption of transmission of the pathogen and a fall in disease to instance of zero in a defined geographical area. So you can talk about eliminating malaria from a country or from a, a continent, for example. Eradication means interruption of the pathogen transmission worldwide. Global eradication goes together. If we're talking about eradication, we're talking about the, the whole world and a fall in disease, disease incidence to zero as a result of a, a concerted effort to achieve that. And then finally, extinction would be if, if there were no more malaria parasites anywhere in, in, in the world, in, in the freezer, in the lab, and so forth. <coughs> so if the question were, can malaria be eliminated, that's an easy one. Yes, malaria certainly can be eliminated. It's been eliminated from the US. Uh, the, the CDC was originally created as an agency to try to uh, uh, control and, and eliminate malaria from the US. And what you see here is the distribution of malaria in the US in the late 1800s. Uh, so you can see there's a little bit of malaria in California, but it was a big problem all throughout most of the continental US and on up into Canada. And this is uh, in 1912 and then uh, in the 1930s. Uh, and so this was done partly through attacking malaria, by attacking the mosquito vector, by draining breeding sites, by doing surveillance and, and treating people who were infected. But really, the major factor was socioeconomic development, was access to health care, was people moving inside homes with windows, uh, and that sort of thing. Because if you look at the distribution of the mosquito vector, that hasn't changed. The mosquitoes are still here. And every now and then, there's a little outbreak of malaria in the US when there are imported cases. This happened in Virginia not too many years ago. Um, Malaria was also a big problem in, uh, in southern Europe, uh, in the Mediterranean. Uh, this shows you the number of deaths per 100,000 inhabitants. Uh, in the black areas are 100 deaths per year per 100,000 inhabitants in southern Italy and, and uh, uh, Sicily and, and Sardinia uh, in the late 1800s. And then uh, after malaria elimination began uh, around 1900 there and uh, showing that they did make progress. Most of that progress was using a drug, was using quinine to uh, both treat and prevent malaria. It was before we had drugs like chloroquine. You can see the conditions were not unlike what we might see when, uh, when we're working in, in sub-Saharan Africa. And with this list of uh, the main infectious diseases afflicting minors in 1902, malaria was far and away the most common with uh, uh, 70 cases per 100 workers in 1902. And again, as with the US, it wasn't just that they had the right tool, and, and it was a, a kind of a, a technical approach. Uh, quininization of Italy occurred in the context of uh, establishing primary health care, uh, workers' rights movements, uh, rural education, and so forth. They, when they just tried to go out and deliver the drug, if they realized if they didn't educate people, if they didn't provide other kinds of health care, it wasn't going to work. And they did make great progress up until, up until uh, World War II then had some major setbacks. And what finally worked was when they combined the drugs with spraying insecticide to get rid of the mosquitoes. Uh, you see here uh, indoor residual spraying of DDT. Uh, once or twice a year, you can spray the inside of a home. The mosquito takes a blood meal, lands on the wall, uh, and drops down dead and can't transmit malaria. And with these two tools, with uh, chloroquine as a highly efficacious drug and DDT spray, there was a great deal of optimism that malaria could actually be globally eradicated. And it's a bit fuzzy, so I'll, I'll read this to you. This is from the WHO in 1958. What they say is, we have now a golden opportunity to free mankind of the world's most prevalent disease and to solve one of the biggest public health problems in the economically underdeveloped countries. The eradication of malaria has become a reality which is within our reach. Uh, and just to show you some, some evidence of uh, reasons for this optimism, uh, what we're looking at here is the deaths per 10,000 people uh, from malaria outside of Africa in the blue bars. And uh, this decrease, of course, wasn't solely attributable to chloroquine, chloroquine and spraying and, and other measures. And then the trend uh, in Africa, you can see, was trending in the same direction. And I'm going to come back to this, uh, this graph in a minute. But first, I just want to show you some maps. Uh, in the 100 years before the eradication campaign began, this is uh, from the mid-1800s to 1945. You can see the distribution of malaria really doesn't change very much at all. Uh, we only discovered uh, what causes malaria and how it's transmitted through mosquitoes uh, around the turn of the 20th century. Uh, but then during the eradication era, which really ran from the late 50s until uh, the late 60s, you see how much this map shrinks. Right? All through North America, uh, significant parts of Latin America, South America, 
Southern Europe, uh, many of the former Soviet republics uh, became malaria-free during that time as a direct result of this eradication campaign, relying mainly on surveillance, drugs, and spraying. To take one, one uh, case in particular, looking at the country of India, in 1947, in the pre-eradication era, there were 75 million cases of malaria reported. By 1961, that was all the way down to 49,000 in, in the whole country of India. It's pretty amazing. Uh, but then something happened. A few years later, it was going back up. And then by 1976, it was back up to 6.5 million. Uh, and again, the reasons are complex. I'm, I'm clearly oversimplifying things. But a big part of that had to do with the loss of DDT to uh, insecticide-resistant mosquitoes and the loss of chloroquine to uh, drug-resistant parasites. And here you see the rest of that curve. Uh, the chloroquine resistance arrived too late to really impact on things outside of Africa but it had a major impact in Africa. And that's this, there is a lot of evidence of uh, very proximate to the arrival of chloroquine in a country, uh, a dramatic increase in, in malaria deaths, uh, severe malaria hospitalizations, and so forth. So it had a huge impact on the continent of Africa. People became very discouraged. It was very hard to maintain the financing and the political will in the face of setbacks. Uh, there's a lot of other uh, reasons why uh, the malaria eradication effort uh, came to an end. And basically what happened was that in the late 60s, the decision was made to uh, go back to thinking about malaria control. Instead of focusing so much on breaking transmission, on attacking the mosquito, uh, it went back to trying to reduce disease and death with not, which, with not so much hope that we could actually impact on, on the level of transmission. So case management, diagnosis, treatment, clinics, trying to understand the pathogenesis of severe malaria became much higher priorities. And interventions tended not to target the whole population in hopes of bringing down transmission, but to target the vulnerable groups, the infants and young children who don't yet have acquired immunity, pregnant women who, with their placental immunity, uh, uh, lose protection when they're pregnant, uh, and, and, and not to worry about uh, interrupting transmission. And so if you look at what happened with the malaria map during the control era, well, not much. It really didn't change very much at all. There was a little bit of progress, again, in the former Soviet republics uh, in, in this region here. But certainly in terms of Africa, uh, most of Asia, there was very little change. So why then are we talking about malaria eradication uh, now? And, and it's not just malaria scientists who are talking about malaria eradication. Uh, the, the celebrities, uh, People magazine here has a piece on Victoria Beckham wearing a mosquito ring and raising funds. Uh, there's a lot of public attention to it. Uh, and, and there's a number of reasons for it. Uh, I think uh, we, to give credit where credit is due, one of the uh, excellent things that uh, George Bush did when he was president was he started something called the uh, President's Malaria Initiative, uh, which whatever else you want to say about that administration, they are delivering very large numbers of uh, bed nets uh, throughout Africa and, and malaria treatments. Uh, and and uh, it's, that's part of a whole scenario of uh, sharply increased donor aid for malaria control to malarious countries since the year 2000. Uh, and um, there's something called the Multilateral Initiative on Malaria that didn't have a lot of money behind it, but really did raise awareness. And uh, Dr. Varmus, who, who's here in the room, I think uh, deserves a lot of credit for really driving this forward and, and getting people to uh, really put malaria and doing something about malaria back on the table in the late 1990s. Uh, and it had an impact. Uh, these are just uh, four examples from uh, uh, around Africa with uh, showing 50% reductions in malaria cases and malaria deaths. Uh, and the same is being seen in a number of countries outside of Africa. This is a slide I got from uh, Rob Newman, who heads the malaria program at uh, WHO. Uh, and, and the current successes are really built around a couple of tools. Uh, one is uh, bed nets that have a long-lasting insecticide. You can uh, keep using the net for uh, as much as two or three years. And even if it gets a little tear in it, the mosquitoes are still uh, killed and, and prevent, uh, it prevents malaria transmission. You do need to do monitoring and evaluation to make sure the nets are being used and used correctly. This is a, a picture I took in Tanzania of a man using a net, a, a mosquito net for a fishing. Um, <coughs> and, and social marketing and, and uptake uh, has been an issue and it works in one, in one setting doesn't necessarily work in another to get people to use these nets. The other major uh, tool we just heard about is the, the artemisinins. Uh, these are based on a Chinese herb uh, that has been used to treat everything from uh, fever to hemorrhoids for uh, 2,000 years uh, in China. And uh, then during the Vietnam War, when they had a problem with resistant uh, chloroquine-resistant malaria in the Ho Chi Minh Trail, the malariologists in China were spared from the Cultural Revolution and allowed to keep working on trying to uh, 
identify compounds that could be uh, better malaria drugs and eventually isolated the, the uh, compounds that uh, are now the, the class of artemisinin drugs that we're using. And we use these in combination with other drugs, much like we do HIV and TB drugs to uh, deter the emergence of resistance. And the so-called ACTs, artemisinin-based combination therapy, uh, is now the first line in almost every country in the world, and, and they've been able to drive the price down. And a very nice feature of these drugs is that they do have uh, an action on the gametocyte forms of the parasite, the sexual forms that are transmitted through the mosquito. Uh, so they, they do appear to reduce transmission. So there's a lot of reason to be hopeful. So much so that uh, people have tried uh, reviving an idea that the WHO actually currently doesn't approve of and giving mass drug administration, treating everybody in the population both with an ACT and a drug that specifically targets these uh, gametocytes that are, that are transmitted, as well as uh, for Plasmodium vivax, it has a, a dormant form in the liver that this drug Permacon gets rid of. And you can see uh, it really drives down dramatically the malaria rates, uh, both for falciparum malaria, vivax malaria, as well as the uh, gametocytes. So based on, on these kinds of uh, success stories, in 2007, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates called for reconsideration of global malaria eradication. Uh, there was a fair amount of skepticism uh, at first, uh, but I think the, the malaria community has come around to the notion that, if nothing else, this is the right goal, that we shouldn't simply be ignoring transmission as we have been since around 1969. Uh, and so uh, Richard Feacham and the Malaria Elimination Group have done a wonderful work uh, thinking through uh, country by country uh, and region by region, what it would take to eliminate malaria. This is a, a map in their report showing areas that currently have no malaria transmission. The ones in blue are countries that are already embarking on or about to embark on malaria elimination. And, and the ones in red uh, are, are still in the control mode. Uh, and so you know, the idea is we can shrink the malaria map. As I said, elimination can be done and is being done. But when we, when we try to then think about eradication, if we look in the middle of that map and think about a place like the Democratic Republic of Congo, where there's chaos, there's war, there's no health system whatsoever, uh, we realize we have a tough job ahead of us. And I hope uh, Phil Rosenthal, when he speaks, will kind of touch on some of the challenges involved in, in moving this into the middle of the map. So to come back to my question, can malaria be eradicated? Uh, maybe I could say yes, if poverty and strife are no longer uh, a problem, and or if we have new and better tools that will work in the midst of poverty and strife. The tools we have, I don't think, are going to work in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, we have these anti-mosquito measures like indoor residual spring and, and long-lasting nets. Uh, we have drugs that we can use. We can think about giving those in a, in a mass administration scheme. Uh, and typically, we think of drugs to attack disease. Uh, we have vaccines in the pipeline, which I'll, I'll touch on uh, toward the end. Uh, which can be uh, used to target the infectious stages of the parasite, to uh, try to reduce disease, and, and also to block transmission. And then drugs we're increasingly thinking of in terms of their impact on transmission. And there's a group called, the, uh, or an initiative called MALERA, from Malaria Eradication Research Agenda, that's been trying to bring people together to brainstorm, uh, to, to really think about how the research agenda needs to change if we're going to be serious about talking about malaria eradication. So things like, can we genetically modify mosquitoes uh, to make them refractory to malaria and then release them into the wild? Uh, so this is supposed to say customs here. Uh, I mean, I, I think it's an intriguing idea. There are some questions about how receptive countries that are refusing to accept genetically modified corn in the midst of famine would be about releasing uh, genetically modified mosquitoes into their populations. Uh, but we, I think we do need to think about crazy ideas, like, for example, if we're trying to go into, into the Congo, could we have a, a sustained release anti-malarial drug? You know, we have, we have drugs like Ambien where we can do that. And in fact, there, there are uh, heartworm drugs for dogs that work for 12 months after a single injection. If we can do this for heartworm for dogs, couldn't we do it for malaria? And in fact, we have done it for malaria. Uh, David Clyde, who was at University of Maryland uh, years ago, uh, reported on injections of cycloguanal pamoate that prevented falciparum malaria for 383 days. Uh, he actually tested this in 15,000 people. Uh, it never really uh, took off because if you didn't inject it just so, you got an abscess in your, in your buttock, but uh, it did prevent malaria. Um, so those are some thoughts about new tools, but uh, I, I need to come back and talk about a real threat to this whole discussion, which is the, uh, the concerning evidence of artemisinin resistance emerging on the Thai-Cambodian border. 
It was reported last year, uh, this is uh, showing you parasite clearance time. You give the drug and you measure how long it takes the parasite to go away. And normally it should, you should be parasite free by around 30 hours after you take, uh, start taking an ACT treatment. Uh, on the Thai Burmese border, that is now up to 50 or 60 hours. And on the Thai Cambodian border, it's up to 80, as much as 100 hours. That, that's very distressing. And there are unpublished data suggesting that it's not just that it takes longer to cure, that the cure rates are also going down. Very worrisome. Especially when we look at the historical precedent of chloroquine resistance, which emerged in the same exact spot on the Thai Cambodian border in the late 1950s and then spread globally, hitting Africa by the late 1970s. And, and these uh, summarize recently published data as well as data that was presented at a meeting I was at in Burma last fall. And we see the epicenter on, on the Thai Cambodian border here. And among all the sentinel sites where the WHO is sponsoring uh, efficacy trials of ACTs, the ones closest to Cambodia were ones where the proportion of people who were still parasite uh, positive on day three after treatment was uh, uh, higher were all the ones closest to Cambodia. So it needs to be confirmed, but it, it's deeply worrying that um, uh, that, that we, we may already have, uh, have let the, the, the horse out of the barn. Um, the WHO is trying to coordinate containment efforts focusing in districts right in Western Cambodia. And the problem is, part of the problem is that we're doing this now without really knowing the direction or the extent of spread because we don't really have good ways of measuring resistance. Um, the way we measure resistance for other drugs uh, includes very easy to use molecular markers, a single polymorphism in the parasite uh, that you can track and, and measure the prevalence. And the Gates Foundation has supported the establishment of a worldwide anti-malarial resistance network that uh, Grant Dorsey and, and Phil Rosenthal, who are here, uh, were very instrumental in, in establishing. And the idea is to have uh, uh, internet-based, uh, real-time, essentially, way of tracking resistance where you can go to the map and, and enter the drug you want and the time window you want. Uh, and, and find out whether there are molecular, clinical, or in vitro um, evidence of, of resistance and, and to what extent to help guide therapy and guide containment efforts. Uh, and, and we're involved with uh, efforts in Southeast Asia to try to develop resistance markers like this for artemisinin so that we can feed into this uh, into network and uh, collecting parasites from clinical trials of our testnate uh, curative therapy in Bangladesh uh, Cambodia and uh, on the Thai Burma border and sequencing for what amounts to genome-wide association studies uh, to try to find uh, the genetic loci that encode for uh, differences in, in resistance uh, between the, the sensitive and the resistant parasites using this clinical phenotype because we don't have a good uh, in vitro phenotype in growing the parasite in culture. And the notion is that you could, once you have a marker like that, you can just go out and, and collect a drop of blood from a finger prick, which you do to diagnose malaria on the microscope slide take it back to the lab in Phnom Penh, which they're doing right now, and do uh, uh, PCR and, and very quickly know the prevalence of a marker. And is resistance going toward Burma? Is it going toward eastern Cambodia? And where should you focus your containment efforts? Uh, and this is really more for uh, Phil and Joe DeRisi's benefit here, just to show some preliminary uh, data using uh, a machine learning approach called random forest. It's just a very powerful way of pinpointing uh, associated factors with a phenotype of interest. What we did is we took uh, a, a 3,000 SNP chip, um, looking at, at SNPs across the falciparum malaria genome, for which we had uh, from our collaborators in Chuan Tzu at NIH measured the 50% uh, the inhibitory concentration of different drugs, and blinded our collaborator who runs this method uh, to uh, which parasites were which. And he very rapidly pinpointed the known chloroquine resistance marker, the known pyrimethamine resistance marker, uh, based on these IC50s. And we've got a hypothetical protein that seemed to correlate with artemisinin IC50. And so we're hopeful that as we get the data from uh, Southeast Asia uh, into this pipeline, we'll be able to pinpoint uh, a marker relatively quickly. If we ask for uh, discussion sake, what has worked for other diseases that, uh, that have been uh, targeted for eradication? Uh, this is a slide from D.A. Henderson, who, who led the uh, smallpox eradication campaign, that, that, which is the one success story we have. And he points out, comparing what uh, failed, uh, what succeeded, and what has nearly succeeded in terms of eradication campaigns, the one thing that they all have in common, with the exception of guinea worm, where you just simply filter the, the worms out of the, the well water, was that the, in every case where we've had good success, vaccines were the principal tool. So that's why I want to end with talking about vaccines just for a minute. Uh, here, here we're seeing the life cycle of malaria. 
and vaccines can target uh, either the pre-erythrocytic forms in the liver to try to block infection completely. Uh, they can target the blood stages, which may not block uh, uh, transmission at all, but is meant to uh, ameliorate disease and death, or you can have transmission blocking vaccines. And historically, these two uh, types of vaccines have been the real priority for the last many years because the idea was to prevent kids from dying of malaria. And increasingly now we're, we're thinking more about transmission blocking vaccines. Uh, the vaccine that's furthest along is called RTSS. It's in a large phase three trial for licensure in Africa based on a number of trials showing that it gives in the range of 30 to 60% efficacy against clinical malaria. So the way I'd like to think about it, it's sort of an injectable bed net. It, it reduces your risk of clinical disease, but it, it doesn't completely prevent infection. And what's completely unknown right now is what impact does it have, if any, on transmission? Uh, so far, nobody has gone and looked, at least hasn't reported, looking at the gametocytes, the sexual forms that are transmitted on the blood smears. We know anybody who's grown parasites in culture knows if you stress the parasite, it goes in the direction to get into the mosquito. Uh, and it may well be that by giving a vaccine that you know kind of knocks it down but not out, you may be driving things to uh, even higher levels of transmission. We need to look at this. Um, a real constraint on developing vaccines is how polymorphic the vaccine antigens are. This is, of course, driven by host immunity. Here we're looking at one of the best antigens based on all kinds of serial epidemiological evidence uh, on protection in, in uh, non-human primate models. It's highly polymorphic with over 60 polymorphisms uh, throughout the whole protein. It's a, it's a protein that's found up in the apical organelles uh, and it's involved with invasion. So antibodies against it block invasion. Uh, the, the team at NIH uh, made a bivalent, two, two different uh, versions of the, of the protein, uh, AMA1 vaccine, and took it into trials in Mali. And here we see the survival curve. There's just absolutely no difference uh, in the proportion who remain malaria-free between the, the kids who got the malaria vaccine and the control vaccine. Uh, we don't know for sure uh, what the reason for that failure is, but we think it's actually that the vaccine simply wasn't immunogenic enough. It didn't make very high antibody levels. It may not be the genetic diversity. Uh, at our sites in Mali, we've actually gone looking at how much diversity there is, something that wasn't done before uh, the antigen was put into a vaccine. And what we've done is map the diversity in the community onto the crystal structure of the protein, with the red being uh, trimorphic or higher residues, the orange being, uh, uh, sorry, the orange being trimorphic. These have four or five or more amino acid possibilities, and the yellow ones are, are dimorphic. Uh, and here's a hydrophobic uh, pocket where the uh, the, is the site of, of binding during invasion, and the kind of a hot spot is up here near that pocket. And the question we wanted to know was, first of all, how diverse is this, and then is a way of reducing the relevant diversity to begin to think about serotypes you could put into a vaccine. And so sequencing over 500 infections, falciparum infections, from this one village in Mali where we're testing vaccines, we found over 214 all low-frequency unique AME1 haplotypes. And so the worst case scenario is we'd need a 214 valent vaccine to protect against all these different variants we've seen in a single Malian town. And so what we've done is try to take a molecular epidemiology approach and not to go into too much detail, but following kids sequentially over time, the idea is that we compare the AMA1 sequence in consecutive paired episodes experienced by these kids and ask if there's a change at this or that position in the molecule between those two paired infections. Is the child more likely to be sick in that second infection? If yes, then that may be an immunologically important amino acid. And when we do that, we can narrow it down, actually, to just this cluster of mutations right around the active site, uh, the binding site, and try to reduce these more than 200 haplotypes into 25 or so putative serotypes. And if you pick the right ones to make a multivalent vaccine, that might be a way of getting protection. And so a vaccine based on a single one of these haplotypes uh, has now gone through phase two testing. Uh, in Mali. The antigen was developed by Walter Reed and the, uh, it's paired with a, a much more immunogenic adjuvant than the earlier vaccine I mentioned. The adjuvant comes from GlaxoSmithKline. It's been shown to be safe uh, and immunogenic in, uh, in both U.S. adults and Mali, Malian adults and children. And uh, this is unpublished data from a, a, this study of 400 Malian children randomized one to one to get this malaria vaccine or a rabies vaccine as a control. And the overall efficacy, not surprising in light of what we just saw in, in the uh, genetic diversity, was not great. It was 17% uh, not statistically significant at the primary endpoint, and around 20% looking at, at uh, first and multiple episodes with secondary endpoints. But the good news is that we see very strong strain-specific efficacy. Uh, there's protection against clinical malaria caused by parasites that match the vaccine strain with respect to those polymorphic 
uh, amino acids in that, in that cluster. And, and one last uh, example that I want to talk about that I'm, I'm hopeful about is uh, based on using the whole organism as a vaccine. All right, this parasite has 5,000 genes. We're trying to pick out one gene product to make a vaccine that's supposed to stop the parasite. It's a, it's a, it's a monstrosity of a, of a pathogen. Uh, and it may be that we, we just don't have enough of an immune response with any one vaccine. So the first malaria vaccine trial ever done in humans was actually done by David Clyde, who earlier had worked on drugs and drug resistance at the University of Maryland. Actually, he did it at Jessup State Prison. It's an interesting story. I think for time reasons, I won't, I won't go into detail. If you're interested, I'll, I'll tell you during the break about some of the politics of that. Uh, and that actually protected 90%. If you get 1,000 infected bites uh, of, of, uh, from uh, irradiated mosquitoes, we've irradiated the, the mosquito to attenuate the parasite, and you use the mosquito as a syringe to inject that as an attenuated vaccine, you get protection. And so uh, Steve Hoffman, who worked for the Navy for many years developing DNA vaccines and viral vectored vaccines, when he retired from the Navy, came back to this original model and has developed a live attenuated sporozoite vaccine, worked out what amounts to really bioengineering issues of how to uh, produce it under aseptic conditions, freeze it, thaw it, vial it, and put it in a syringe and inject it. And so uh, over the last year or so, a trial has been underway uh, at the U.S. Navy and at our place, the University of Maryland, to, uh, to test this in escalating doses of sporozoites, attenuated sporozoites delivered this way. And uh, we're, we're waiting with bated breath uh, for the results. So I, I think I'd better stop there and turn it over to my, uh, my distinguished panel for some uh, further discussion. But to come back one last time to the question, can malaria be eradicated? I'll say yes, but probably not in my lifetime. Uh, my, my, I have one grandmother who's still alive, so I think I might have a couple, two or three decades left. Uh, but I think there are some younger people in the room who I hope it can happen in their lifetime. And, and, uh, I think if you're a young scientist, you shouldn't let all this talk of malaria eradication dissuade you in any way from taking up malaria research, because I think it's going to be a, a, a growth area in research for, uh, for a long time to come, and really do need new talents uh, and new ideas and, and, and tools. So I think with that, I'll stop and uh, just thank my many collaborators in Maryland and in Mali and elsewhere who have contributed to some of the work that I've summarized here. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. I'll now ask uh, Jody Rissi, Phil Rosenthal, and Richard Fitchum to come to the podium. Or, or you can stay there and, yeah. You each, you each will have five minutes to give a talk, and then you can sit. Jody Rissi. Introduce yourself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Joe DeRisi. Uh, I'm a professor here in the Department of Biochemistry and Biophysics here at UCSF. And I'm very uh, uh, privileged and honored to be able to be part of this panel today um, for Mike Bishop's symposium. Uh, Mike has been instrumental in helping my career along here at UCSF, and I thank him for that. And it's just an amazing privilege to be here and work in the institution that Mike has served so well. Uh, so my lab works on uh, malaria and other infectious diseases. We work on a lot of uh, virology projects together with Dr. Don Gannam. And part of our, uh, I don't have any slides, so you can kill that thing if you want, um, rather than look at the uh, <clears throat> input RGB1. Uh, and so uh, I'd like to just talk about, just briefly, some issues that have come up and, um, and um, play off of some of Chris Plough's points that he made. There are significant challenges ahead. So yes, we might be able to eradicate malaria, maybe not in our lifetime, or depends. But uh, there's some issues we need to deal with. First of all, we don't really understand how the parasite evades the host. And it clear, clearly does evade the host quite well. So our knowledge about how the parasite interacts with the human immune system while growing is still woefully thin. Uh, we don't understand how the parasite manipulates the host specifically. So not just how the host can kill the parasite, but how the parasite responds in kind. How uh, we don't uh, possess any true molecular correlates of protection. There's nothing we can measure right now other than an endpoint in a human that would be predictive of whether they would be resistant to challenge with a malaria infection. 
and that's pretty sad. We don't possess examples of broadly neutralizing antibodies. There's been fantastic work in HIV lately on uh, some structural work and other things on these amazing new broadly neutralizing antibodies. No such thing, to my knowledge, exists in malaria, and we do need it. We don't understand how uh, parasites resist the new drugs or the current drugs like artemisinine. We don't even understand the targets of what artemisinine is. We don't actually know what artemisinine is doing specifically to the parasite, which is uh, pretty amazing since all the new frontline drugs essentially are in the pipeline in one form or another use combinations with artemisinine or art artemisinine derivatives. Uh, and I'll just say outright, if you're interested in getting into this, uh, malaria is a pain to grow. It's no fun. The genetics are awful. Uh, there is no RNAi. That's enough to make half the basic scientists run out of the room. Uh, there are no known natural viral vectors for getting things in and out of the genome. Uh, and, and so that there's the other half can run out of the room. Um, but there's reasons, so besides all that doomsday talk, there's reasons to be optimistic. Technology is really rapidly changing. Let's just put it in perspective here for a minute. So the uh, chloroquine resistance first appeared around 19, uh, the late 1950s, early 1960s. And it took about 40 years to figure out what the gene was. So there was a gene mutated that caused chloroquine resistance. That's the PFCRT gene, David Fiddock, Tom Wellams, and others. Uh, and so 40 years, that's kind of a long time. HIV uh, was first reports in New York, 1981 or so, and the identification of HIV uh, as etiologic agent for AIDS was um, 1984, 1985, so four to five years. So that's a much shorter time. Now let's take it to 2003, when the SARS outbreak occurred. Uh, Carlos Urbani first reported the WHO, uh, SARS as a distinct clinical entity in March 10th, March 10th, 2003. And on March 24th, 14 days later, we knew what the agent was. So going from an unknown acute respiratory disease to actually identification of the utilized agent uh, took only two weeks. And, and so the time scale of which things are allowed to occur is, is shrunk dramatically. And this extends to all aspects of basic biology too. Genome sequencing, the falciparum genome took up, you know, about a decade to sequence and to get done. And now a graduate student can do eight methalciparum genomes in a couple weeks if they really try. Uh, so uh, that is a point that I'll, I'll just hammer home a little bit um, more soundly. The cost of sequencing, of figuring out, and this is what's required, sequencing is required to figure out molecular changes in genomes and resistances and so on. This cost of sequencing in the past five years has dropped 100,000 fold. That's a big number. Nothing changes by 100,000 fold in biology, you know, in our technology these days, uh, not, not in computers or anything. And so it's, there's about a 100,000 fold increase in sequencing output as well. And so that's like going from Galileo's microscope 400 years ago to the Hubble in, in, instead of taking 400 years in, uh, in four years. So we're at a time of dramatic technology changes. And this extends far past sequencing, proteomics, metabolomics, all sorts of things, uh, the ability to re-engineer uh, microbial systems to produce drugs like artemisinin, J. Kieslin's, uh, Amaris, and so on, uh, and our ability to understand the immune system. I think it's actually possible right now with technology that we have through deep sequencing, proteomics, and other technologies to understand and examine the entire repertoire of antibodies produced by a single individual with change of an infection. This so new era of, I, I know you're going to cringe when I say this, seromics, um, <laughs> uh, I had to say it, uh, it, is going to change things because now we can actually examine how host adaptive immune responses are changing at, at a complete and quantitative level. And so how can you bring it to bear? I mean, maybe what we need to do is identify uh, similar to HIV, identify elite suppressors and figure out who's making those rare special antibodies that are broadly neutralizing, that target perhaps the rare protective epitopes and not just the highly polymorphic immunodominant antigens that we've grappled with so in a, such a difficult way over the last several decades. And of course the goal there is 100% protection, um, not partial protection. And so what will it take to figure out why artemisinin is failing? You've heard that artemisinin probably is failing. It, there's definite evidence of that. It's getting worse. And uh, can the world really afford to wait another 40 years to figure it out? Um, not really. 
it's like seeing I, I, it's like kind of this it's like seeing the oil on the top of the gulf of mexico but you don't know where bp sank their rig that's about what the problem is right now and it's kind of ridiculous that we don't know where the rig sank uh, and so there's no way you can cap the well so I propose we need not much just more than technology we need a new community spirit as well akin to what uh, Chris was talking about with Warren and so on and that uh, much like the SARS epidemic uh, samples should be sent everywhere to everyone including people that don't work on malaria to rapidly figure this out instead of being controlled by a few with uh, waiting till publication comes out and so on there should be real-time analysis of the actual data as well and samples of clinically validated resistant malaria serum from patients who survive or fail malaria should actually go to, to everyone and this is how SARS was beaten quickly and I think that we could do the same in malaria and this includes field isolates and so on so my point is let's figure this out in weeks not years because really there's not a moment to lose I guess I introduce myself. I'm Phil Rosenthal. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, I do have slides. I hope they show up. Uh, I'm going to speak very briefly about, um, well, I hate to be a little downbeat. I don't want to sound downbeat. I just want to sound realistic after uh, Joe's uh, inspirational discussion of uh, how new technologies can help us. Excuse me. Uh, but. I'm going to talk about uh, the area where the challenge is the greatest, and that's uh, obviously sub-Saharan Africa, where, as you all know, the burden of malaria is greatest. Uh, but what I'll be talking about will have relevance to other areas of the world with uh, very high transmission of malaria. And I'm going to use it as an example for this discussion the, the part of the malarious world uh, I know best, which is uh, Uganda, where a lot of our studies uh, are taking place. This map shows uh, levels of uh, malaria transmission intensity across Uganda, ranging from the red areas with the highest level of transmission down to yellow and white areas uh, with low level, lower level of transmission in uh, the mountainous areas of southwestern Uganda. Uh, you can measure transmission intensity by, this is old fashioned, this isn't what Joe was talking about, by collecting mosquitoes and looking for uh, how many of them harbor uh, malaria parasites and can trans transmit disease, uh, leading to something called the entomological inoculation rate, or EIR, the number of infected mosquito bites per person per year. Uh, if that number is one, that means in a given area, on average, people get infected once a year. That's a high number, and uh, that would be alarming in many areas. But this is sub-Saharan Africa, and the scale is different. So in uh, a number of parts of uh, southern and central Uganda, you see EIRs of about 5 to 10. So people are infected about 5 or 10 times a year uh, with malarious parasites. So uh, that's a very alarming number. But then you move to central and northern Uganda, you see these astronomical numbers of uh, malaria transmission intensity. Hundreds of infective mosquito bites per year. In these areas, more than one infected mosquito bite per day. So this, uh, this shows us the overwhelming challenge for control to start with and eventually elimination and eradication of malaria in sub-Saharan Africa. But luckily we do have tools of course, you've heard about these already. Uh, I just want to mention uh, one uh, briefly, the, the first on the list, effective therapy for acute malaria. If we can treat malaria well, uh, of course we can uh, prevent disease uh, from progressing to severe disease and potentially death in children. That's a, obviously a very important goal. But in addition, we eliminate parasites from that child's bloodstream so we prevent transmission uh, to others. And of course, the wonderful news is that uh, after years of, of poor drugs, we have a, a collection of, of really highly effective drugs, all different artemisinin-based combination therapies. And these really make a difference. Uh, see if I can get this. Uh, this, this is a compilation of a, a large amount of data from multiple clinical trials in Uganda that uh, Grant Dorsey put together showing uh, with a number of different drugs uh, and uh, standard therapy of children with uncomplicated malaria and then 28 days of follow-up how often uh, they got malaria again within 28 days. 
In green, recurrent malaria means they got malaria again, and in red is uh, treatment, true treatment failure. When we did molecular genotyping, we saw that they were infected with the same organism as at the beginning of the trial, so we had a true treatment failure. By either measure, you see chloroquine in the first column, uh, a synonym for chloroquine could be placebo. Chloroquine is really completely useless to treat malaria. Other drugs are, are better, but still not very good, and really are by far our best drugs now are the artemisinin combinations, the last two drugs in this histogram, uh, finally reaching uh, numbers that are, are not perfect. We do see some recurrences, but we're doing quite well. But this is Kampala. This is uh, not the red area on my map of Uganda. Let's go to the red area and look at results. Look at those last two drugs here, artesanate amidioquine and artemethrin lumefantrine. And now, what are the results of a similar trial in Tororo? You see, again, we do really well preventing, uh, treating malaria. The red bars are just about zero. Uh, our drugs are great. Our new artemisinin-based combinations are great. But in following the children for a month after therapy, you see that the majority of them got malaria again within just one month. Even with AL, artemethrin lumefantrine, the uh, first-line regimen, the new first-line regimen for malaria in Uganda, 50, more than 50% of kids are getting malaria again. So we're doing very well at treating malaria now. That's an important advance, but we've got to do better at also uh, controlling malaria and preventing subsequent infection. So uh, very briefly to summarize, uh, the challenges here, the big, big challenge is the extremely high malaria transmission intensity, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. There are a few other parts of the world that approach that also. So we'll get frequent recurrences after even successful therapy. And so we need to think more about preventing malaria, not just treating it. Chris talked about a number of, uh, a number of other measures that together, hopefully, and eventually with vaccines, will allow us to get there. Another important point earlier in this is that as transmission intensity decreases, as we start to see success, we also will see decrease in immunity. Uh, we won't have the high level of immunity that African children have after a number of episodes of malaria. So poor responses due to drug resistance will become more common. When we have drug regimens that are not perfect, and that's the case now, uh, a less immune population will do worse. And also severe malaria with a less immune population may become more common. So we certainly may hit bumps in the road as we get, make progress towards uh, control and, and elimination uh, in these very high transmission areas. And of course, the huge area that I, I can only mention are the many, many challenges of public health in the developing world. Everything uh, is, is very challenging, and it's a, it's a great effort. But, but I, I know that uh, Richard will be more upbeat than me. I don't want to end this by being too to uh, pessimistic. I think what makes me most optimistic about malaria actually is that the problem is so bad in these areas, the red areas in the map, that we could easily make things much, much better. And that's our goal in the short term, uh, that uh, we have a long way to go uh, in between where we are now and elimination, and there'll be a lot of benefit from that. Lastly, I just want to take this opportunity to mention that there's a really nice growing collaboration between uh, UCSF investigators and McCary University, our, our main a collaborating group in Uganda uh, with now about a dozen, I've only listed faculty members here, about a dozen faculty members uh, collaborating on research on malaria or malaria HIV co-infection, a number of others working on, not listed on TB and, and other uh, medical research areas, and an outstanding group of uh, collaborators in Uganda led by uh, Moses Kamya, just a tiny subset listed here. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Well, good morning. Uh, good morning, everybody. And uh, it's a great pleasure and a great honor to uh, take part in this uh, symposium to pay tribute to, to Mike and his incredible contributions to UCSF. Um, my role is to um, end the panel discussion by giving a, a big picture overview of where we are and where we're heading um, in malaria. And I'll start by a word about strategy. And then I'll talk about some spectacular good news and spectacular progress. And then I'll end on a, on a rather sobering challenge, which also has a, a silver lining. So let's start with strategy. Um, Chris mentioned that in October 2007, Bill and Melinda Gates surprised the world by calling for eradication in their lifetime. Um, and I'm very much a fan and supporter of that goal. There is skepticism, and the skepticism is undoubtedly healthy. But since that announcement, there's been a great deal of work 
to clarify the macro strategy of how to get from where we are today, which is a very malarious world, to a malaria-free world. And we think we'll get there maybe in 50 or 60 years. It'll be a long journey. But what is the strategy that guides that journey? And UCSF has made a big contribution to formulating this strategy, which when I say it to you will sound incredibly obvious, but actually it wasn't obvious two years ago when we started on this work. It's a three-part strategy. And the first part is aggressive control in the heartland. Aggressive control using all known interventions that are effective and powerful in the high transmission areas to bring mortality down to extremely low levels and morbidity and transmission down as low as we can get it. And of course in doing that we use today's tools today and tomorrow's tools tomorrow. And tomorrow's tools will be much better than today's tools because science is really driving it forward. The second part of the strategy is progressive spatial elimination from the endemic margins inwards. We call this shrinking the malaria map so that the number of countries that have malaria at all continues to progressively decrease. And the third part of the big strategy is research, 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 research. As Chris and, and my fellow panelists have emphasized, we need better drugs. We need that first vaccine, but it won't be very good. We need a second vaccine and a third vaccine and a fourth vaccine. We need them quickly. We need new insecticides. We haven't had a new insecticide for decades. Um, we need better diagnostics and so on. There is a very rich agenda for research to bring forward new and better tools. So that's the strategy. And we need to do all those things together and with great commitment. This is not do one, then do two, then do three. This is do all of those at the same time with energy and commitment and adequate finance. So let's have a little bit of history building on, on uh, Chris's presentation of the history of malaria. Let's look at malaria by country. And a red country is a country that has malaria endemicity somewhere within its borders. And a green country is a country that doesn't. So green countries either never had malaria or have eliminated it. And if we go back to 1945, some of us were alive in 1945, maybe not many looking around the audience, but a few, but it isn't very long ago. And in round figures, there are 200 countries in the world, roughly speaking. And back in 1945, they all had malaria with very few exceptions. So we lived in a universally malarious world. Fast forward to today, and about 100 countries have got rid of it. So 200 countries in the world. Today, 100 countries, the green countries on this map, no longer have malaria. They have eliminated it. And as you will see, they're all at the margins of the endemic zone. So we have dramatically shrunk the malaria map in the last uh, 65 years. Um, the light blue countries on the map um, are countries that are in elimination mode today. And as you can see, they're all on the margins of the endemic zone. And the red countries are countries that are still um, in, uh, in control mode, but will become eliminators as the borders of malaria move to their borders. And roughly speaking, we're moving malaria southwards in the northern hemisphere and we're, we're moving malaria northwards in the southern hemisphere. And you can see the pattern of what that looks like. And UCSF has become very engaged in this elimination effort, particularly where you see the sunbursts on this map. Uh, so China, Melanesia and southern Africa are the areas of particular focus. And we've also actually... Um, helped to catalyze and helped to um, organize and mobilize two exciting new regional initiatives. One of them, the Asia Pacific Malaria Elimination Initiative, which embraces 10 elimination countries in the Asia Pacific region. And that effort, effort is led by Dr. Michel Shang, who's with us this morning. And in Southern Africa, the initiative that we call the E8, the Elimination 8, which are the four eliminators where you see the sunburst 
and the four countries immediately to their north. And these regional uh, efforts are extremely important because malaria crosses, crosses borders a lot, not because of the mosquitoes, but because of humans carrying the parasite crossing borders. So these regional cross-border efforts are very important. This work on elimination and reducing malaria in the red countries uh, bringing down the morbidity and mortality rates in the red countries really has gone spectacularly well. Partly because of the new technologies, which uh, Chris and others referred to, but partly because of the money. And since 2002 and the creation of the Global Fund to fight HTB and malaria, the Global Fund has been investing billions of dollars per year in malaria, money which was not going into malaria before. And 60-70% of all uh, malaria finance now comes from the Global Fund alone and it's these flows of funds which are driving this progress together with the new technologies and together with the incredible ded dedication of the men and women on the front line who actually do the hard work every day. Optimism, here's some optimism. 2025, um, I think, with the efforts of all the younger scientists in this room and a lot of dedication by a lot of people around the world, I think the world is going to look like this in 2025. The green area has expanded a lot. We have many more green countries. And the red area has become this lurid, whatever that color is, I'm not sure, but that lurid color, indicating that morbidity and mortality have been reduced greatly. So malaria has been squeezed but also the level of endemicity, the burden of morbidity and mortality have been greatly reduced even in the heartland. And the process will continue to eradication who knows when, 2050, 2060, no one can know. But it will depend, as um, Joe and Phil and Chris have emphasized, it will depend on new technologies. We will need better drugs. We will need a vaccine that is really efficacious, particularly a transmission blocking vaccine. We will need new insecticides. We will need better diagnostics. So this won't happen without the science. And the science is moving fast. So we can anticipate new tools. So that's the very optimistic story. But I want to end on, um, on a challenging note, um, which has to do with where the money is coming from. Because this is the marriage of science programmatic effort in the field and the money to pay for it all. And the money to pay for it all has been primarily the Global Fund, which gets its money primarily from the rich country governments of the world. And those flows of fund are now very much in jeopardy because of the global financial crisis. So the wealthy countries of the world have mainly committed themselves not to let the global financial crisis interfere with their foreign assistance programs, with their aid programs. They have mainly said, the US government has said, most European governments have said, the global fi financial crisis will not diminish our rising annual commitments of aid to the developing world, including our commitments for malaria, either through the Global Fund or bilaterally. And those promises are beginning to be broken and will be serially broken. The first domino to fall has been Spain, and two weeks ago Spain announced a 10% reduction, a $600 million reduction in its aid budget. The German budget will be announced in a few weeks' time. Watch out for that. The US Congress is engaged in a very difficult debate about the US aid budget. Obama and the White House are asking for increasing levels. The mood in Congress is not favorable to that. So we will see a domino effect of the wealthy countries one by one breaking their promise to maintain the flows of aid. The reason they will do that is because of their deficits. Their deficits are horrendous. The true magnitude of those deficits is only now coming home to roost and being realized. And it will lead to a reduction in aid budgets. And this will pro provide us with a challenging few years before aid budgets pick up again and the Global Fund is adequately financed. Now, we should never allow a good crisis to be wasted. And this is an excellent example of taking advantage of the biggest financial crisis that any of us have ever lived through. And it's all to do with spending smarter. If the amounts of money either flatline or decline in the next three or four years, as I believe they will, 
the imperative is to ensure that every dollar is spent smarter, is spent with more effect, with less wastage, with greater efficiency, with greater impact on morbidity and mortality than has been the case in the past. And I hope that UCSF can play a major role in ensuring that we do spend the reduced amounts of money smarter and end up in a better position in terms of our ability to really bear down on malaria when funds begin to pick up again in 2015 or beyond. Thank you very much. Well, that was, uh, those are a series of exciting presentations. And we have 30 minutes for the audience to engage intensely. So we ask that you uh, prepare your questions and short questions. So there will be short answers so we can have more questions. I, I just want to start uh, by asking uh, Joe a question. Uh, he has been known to famously say that you don't just work with malaria, but you have a relationship with it. <laughs> now, I don't know if he's going to tell us about the secrets of his relationship with malaria, but I would like, you give us this big picture, exciting picture, where uh, science and technology is going. Could you tell us just in a few words specifically what your lab is actually doing? Uh, so yeah, you, you, uh, the, 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 my comment about having a relationship with malaria was just to say that uh, if you want to work on malaria, I really believe that you have to commit to it. It's not something you could just dabble in. It's something that if you're, gonna, if you're in, you're in, and you gotta, and you got to do it uh, with um, sort of a full commitment to it. Uh, my lab works on various aspects of malaria, including um, drug development, host immunity, and so on. We have an ongoing effort using animal models, mice primarily, uh, led by Charlie Kim in my lab, to examine what are the innate immune responses to malaria and what are the determinants by which the host can control parasitemia. Uh, and that, uh, I think, will give us a lot of insights into how the first line of defense combats malaria in the host. Uh, we also work on artemisinin resistance. I talked about that drug resistance, so we're collaborating with Dennis Kyle, the University of South Florida, to examine some of his strains, which were in vitro evolved to have artemisinin resistance. The caveat there that what's in the field may not be the same as what you can do in a dish in the lab. And so those caveats aside, though, mechanisms of resistance there may shed light, and we hope they will, on uh, what's going on in the field. There's some exciting uh, data there, and, and one of the interesting things that has been uh, recently um, detailed in, uh, in publications and in our work that's uh, going to come out soon, we hope, is uh, that the parasite has the ability to perhaps lie dormant for a while, that instead of just dying when treated with a drug, the parasite may be able to stay static for a while as if uh, oh, not quite in a spore form, I won't go that far, but a form that is not progressing through the life cycle, but it's not dying either. And when the drug is withdrawn, the patient feels better, stops taking the drug, the parasites may then resume growth after some delay. What is that checkpoint? What is that dormancy? What is going on at that point, and how can it be disrupted? That's where the combination therapies are most likely going to have best effect. Um, so, and then we're working on other technologies to uh, um, develop new ways of doing whole proteome immunoprofiling to understand the repertoire of antibodies that are produced and so on. So we're trying to approach it from many different angles. It's a long-winded answer. Questions from the floor. Yes. Could you identify yourself? So the, the red being Malaysia in Richard Feacham's talk of the world where you saw malaria 
is immediately adjacent to um, Borneo, which is red, I'm sorry, and Malaysia, which is green. And the difference there is political will. We have a lot of really great um, uh, vaccines online, which should be great and should be invested in. However, now that we need to spend smarter, I think that you, we should really look hard at places that are adjacent geographically, the same Muslim background, the same practices, but different political will. And how can we turn the, those countries green, that are red now, um, with what we have? And I think that that is perhaps where we should focus a lot of our a lot of our energy is actually on providing incentive for that political will. Anyway, thank you very much. That was a good talk. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for that comment. Um, and I think I agree, and we we, we all agree. Um, in the case of Malaysia and Indonesia, um, on my 2010 map. Um, Malaysia is that light blue color indicating it's eliminating. It still has malaria, but it's in elimination mode. And Indonesia is red, meaning that it's still in control mode. Um, interestingly, uh, Indonesia was invited to be a member of the Asia-Pacific Malaria Elimination Network and is a member exactly because of those cross-border issues. And because Indonesia has made now a big political commitment to get serious about malaria and does indeed have elimination goals for Java ambitiously um, and for, for Bali and one or two other areas. But this cross-border issue between Malaysia and Indonesia on the island of Borneo, uh, between Namibia and Angola, we're working on this on a daily basis, major cross-border issues. And if you take that example, Namibia very committed um, there are only two countries in the world that have card-carrying malariologists as their Minister of Health, and Namibia is one of them, um, and very committed to elimination. North of the border in Angola, chaotic, and, and much less commitment. So you're absolutely right. Uh, political commitment really matters, and GNP per capita really matters. Uh, Namibia is, is, is much wealthier than Angola, although that's rapidly changing. Malaysia is much wealthier than Indonesia, and that isn't rapidly changing. So um, political commitment, yes. GMP per capita, um, less poverty, all these things are very germane. But your point is well taken. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to make sure I called on students and young faculty before I called on Bruce. <laughs> so Bruce, you can ask a question. Or Harold, Harold. My hand, Bruce's face. <laughs> <laughs> Intr yeah, introduce Varmus. yourself. Harold Varmus, Memorial Stone Kettering. Um, I uh, heard a lot about politics and plasmodia and something about vaccines, but not too much about the insects, about uh, Anopheles. And I wonder if um, a little more can be said by the panelists about uh, efforts to take use of our, make use of our growing understanding of the olfaction system of plasma of, uh, of uh, Anopheles and uh, perhaps something about introduction of, of genetically altered species, especially s sterile males into, uh, in, into highly malaria zones. <laughs> Chris, would you like to start? I, I did show that picture of the mosquito with the green eyes and, and, and the cartoon. And, yeah. Uh, right. No, they, as you, I'm sure you know there, there's been work going on for many years, including NIH and, and other places, to try to genetically modify mosquitoes. And in the lab, uh, there's just reported out of the lab at Johns Hopkins not too long ago, you can engineer mosquitoes that are both uh, refractory to malaria and at least as fit, if not more fit, than native populations. Uh, and in addition to the one challenge that I alluded to, which is simply getting people to accept the notion of going out and releasing a gen genetically modified mosquito, I mean, there is precedent in agriculture where that's been done successfully with sterile males and, and other approaches. Uh, the other thing that we really don't understand and, and need to, to know whether this is a viable approach is the population genetics of mosquitoes. And so, for example, there's a lot of work done in Mali, you know, the team that you visited uh, some years ago, uh, trying to understand to what extent the mosquito populations are panmictic versus, you know, individual islands of breeding. And if you release something, do you have to go release it in every village, in every mud puddle, or can you release it and will it, it spread? Um, I don't actually know the work about olfaction that you alluded to. Maybe if anybody else would like to chime in. 
or if you would like to. <laughs> well, I, I don't want to chime in about olfaction either. I, I'm sorry, I don't know that. But uh, I, I did hear Tony James, who's a leader in this area from uh, UC Irvine, speak about this uh, not too long ago. And he was backtracking a bit. He, he was noting that uh, you're really not talking about a genetically engineered mosquito. There are hundreds of different Anopheles species that transmit malaria. And he was uh, accepting the fact that this would be one control measure uh, maybe directed against Anopheles gambiae and a few of the leading vectors. And it would be one. So it's another one of the tools, not, not probably the panacea. And obviously, there are a lot of challenges to get there. I, would you like to say something on the olfactory? Could I just quickly add to that? I, I, I think by far the biggest priority in the vector control arena is to bring forward genuinely new classes of insecticide. We haven't had a new insecticide for about 30 years. And there are many places where we use the same class of insecticide on the bed nets and on the indoor residual spraying, which is a really bad idea. Um, we need new classes of insecticide, and we need to prevent the European Union and the United States banning agricultural imports from countries that use these insecticides. Well, just to comment briefly, since no one else is uh, interested in the other issue, um, there, are, there is work from Rockefeller and from, and from uh, uh, Indiana on the nature of the, the olfactory receptors, and uh, there are, there, there's tremendous potential for developing uh, basically uh, chemicals that, that deter monopolies from landing on human beings and, go, and going elsewhere. This is actually uh, a, a reminiscent of a traditional medieval response of ringing villages with, with animals to try to attract uh, uh, <laughs> insects that carry pathogens from entering, entering the villages. But uh, the deflection of, of uh, monopolies away from the human host uh, I think has a lot of promise now that we know some of the, the, the molecular nature of the, of the olfactory receptors and have screens that allow us to, uh, to allow um, a lot of work supported by the Gates Foundation to, uh, to uh, find deterrence to, um, to mosquito attack on certain hosts like, like humans. Yeah, I'll just make one last comment. That it's, yeah, we need more than just citronella candles. You know, it's, it's really cut it anymore. <laughs> and, uh, and and I think that um, destruction of the insects, or you know, by insecticides or deterrence, is really the way to go. I, I worry a little bit about the genetically engineered mosquitoes, not because I think we're going to get Frankenstein mosquitoes or anything, but they carry you know mosquitoes carry a lot more than just malaria. And a, a, a super fit mosquito kind of scares the hell out of me. For other reasons. Right. Yeah. So it's just sterile. I mean, that the, the numbers are pretty um, pretty daunting about how many you would have to release in a given area. So it would require a pretty industrial effort. That's for sure. Could, could, I, could I just ask uh, Bruce Alberts? So, uh, Phil talked about this. I had no idea that uh, people were getting that many bites per. Per day, and uh, and then uh, there must be many uh, people carrying quite uh, effective uh, antibodies or something. Uh, and and then Joe mentioned the fact that you know uh, there should be some major concerted effort to collect uh, the blood from these people and distribute it widely. Is that happening? Yeah, absolutely. It's been happening for decades, but our tools are getting better. Uh, it's clear that anti-malarial immunity is, in a way, very effective. Without that, humans would never have evolved out of Africa because falciparum malaria would have prevented uh, human uh, development. But on the other hand, uh, it comes at a great cost. It comes at the cost of multiple infections of young children, many of which are fatal, until you develop effective immunity. And uh, we could have said that 30 years ago. We haven't really learned that much. We, uh, there are probably a number of uh, uh, parasite antigens, which are immunologic smoke screens. They, they prevent an, a more effective immune response. But we really don't understand it very well. Uh, we do have better tools in terms of better studies, better collections of anisera from uh, cohort studies uh, around the world now, and we have better tools to study uh, the immune responses. So hopefully that's an area where we can make good progress in the near future, and maybe Joe wants to talk more about the technical side of that. I might jump in if I could, uh, just to say that you know, the malariologists haven't been sitting on their thumbs for the past 30 years, the immunologists haven't been. It's a really complicated relationship between the host and the parasite, so we have all these different surface antigens of the different life cycle stages, 
And in the blood stage, there's a family of genes of, the, of which there are about 60 different variants in the genome, and they're unbelievably polymorphic. And when I show you that picture of the infected cell and the little, the little dots on it, those are islands of these cytoadherence proteins, and the parasite can shift among these uh, 50 or 60 different versions of it. So the minute you respond to one, you know, you're selecting for some other one that is now in a, in a minority subpopulation, and that grows up, and that may be sticky for a different organ. So until you acquire, the, the theory is until you acquire a repertoire of immunity to a whole range of antigens and a whole range of variants of some of these antigens, which are unbelievably variant, uh, you don't have protection. So uh, trying to sort out that story does require new tools but it's, it's been a long, a long road to hoe. Keith? Uh, Keith Yamamoto. I, I was um, struck by, by uh, Joe's call to expand information and feel, get the information out into the rest of the world, um, and by Richard's uh, call to spend smart, which I think we're really going to need to pay attention to. And I'm wondering if you could comment, or on the panel, could comment on ways uh, that might, this might be done. I, I've been involved recently in some discussions of ways to support big scientific questions, diff different modes of support, big scientific questions uh, on the cheap, so to speak. And one of the things that uh, has struck me is the scientists' um, uh, uh, enthusiasm for getting involved in contests and competitions of various sorts. Mm -hmm. uh, we all know about what happens with protein folding. Um, uh, the computer science community uh, does this regularly, having uh, uh, puny prizes for big questions, $1,000, and you get 35,000 people entering. Um, uh, and, and so my question, it, it seems that malaria is one of these um, problems that has the capacity to be so broad-reaching that where, where inputs from such a, a large component of the community could actually make a difference largely from people who don't even know that they could have make a contribution because they don't know enough about the questions. So the question for the panel is whether it would be possible and worthwhile to be able to break down a set of very specific questions that various engineers and mathematicians and uh, 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 medical practitioners can realize that they've got something to say about um, and be able to mount competitions of this sort that could simply, you just throw these questions out on the internet and simply ask the community to throw in their best ideas. Um, and, and so, talk about spending smart. If that would work, uh, it could really, you know, some things could bubble to the surface that just haven't been imagined yet. Um, and would it be worth the effort to begin to sort of put a fine point on some of these uh, questions? Uh, in a way, Joe, it, it says that you can develop a relationship that is more kind of like a hobby uh, where a contribution can be made, and I think that we need to be able to expand the community in that way. Uh, would it be worth trying to put some effort into defining questions of that sort? Yeah, no doubt. I'll just comment first. I think an X Prize for this kind of thing. The X Prize is really the model, and, uh, and the X Prize for different uh, hard problems in malaria would be fantastic. I mean, you know, there's more than 6,000 labs that work on yeast, and that's one lab per gene. If they all took a gene, we'd be done with it, but that's not how it really works. But, um, you know, that would be amazing to recruit that sort of expertise into malaria, and uh, it would not just have to be just posing the problem on the Internet, though. It would be provide real backing in terms of access to reagents and serum and uh, so on, so that you could, so anybody who's never even worked on malaria could actually just order up a bunch of DNA and it would show up and it wouldn't cost them anything and they could participate in the contest. I think that would be fantastic. That would be huge. Henry? Uh, my name is Henry Bourne. I'm at UCSF. I, I just want to ask about also spending smarter but in the specific context of a place like UCSF and young investigators who are going out into their careers, what are the incentives other than idealism, okay, uh, to do so in the field of malaria? That is, is there um, a lot of knowledge among young uh, postdocs that you can do this? Is there a lot of money for them to do their research? Are there lots of labs for them to go into? Is this a viable career choice for some of our brightest people? Because I think a lot of it has to do with how we spend our money motivating 
young people uh, to, because they're the ones who are gonna do even more than probably the people in this room uh, 20 years from now to really close the thing down. I can try to respond to that. So I, the reason I got into malaria was because as a young medical student, I had an opportunity to travel, and I sort of did research as a way of paying my ticket, and then I ended up getting seduced by the research, and that's what I try to do with uh, young medical students is, you know, they come with a very vague notion of wanting to do something in global health, and I send them to Mali or someplace, and, and, and they hopefully will kind of realize that if they want to make a living doing something like this, a good way to do it is to become a, a researcher. And in, in terms of the, uh, the kind of the, the market for malaria research, I have to say a certain former NIH director really changed the landscape in the 90s uh, with, I mentioned the multilateral initiative on malaria, but also NIAID and the other institutes at NIH really increased the level of funding. The Wellcome Trust has done that. Uh, the Gates Foundation has come on the scene. So I, I think if you do a graph of the dollars for malaria research, it's been a pretty steady upward trend uh, and we, we had this malaria process, the malaria, malaria eradication research agenda, had a, a zenith week in March, and, and Richard and, and Grant and some others were there, uh, where we came together with a, a larger part of the malaria community to get buy-in and, and kind of fine-tune the ideas that had come out over a series of meetings over about a year and a half. And uh, on the last day, we had our uh, leadership council consisting of Tony Fauci, uh, Mark Walport, the head of the uh, Wellcome Trust, uh, Margaret Chan, the head of WHO, uh, Tachi Yamada, the head of uh, health for the Gates Foundation, and Awa Kalsak from Rollback Malaria. And to a person, they all bought into the need uh, for uh, reorienting the malaria research agenda toward eradication and elimination. And there was no immediate concrete promise of new funds. Uh, but uh, certainly for the Gates Foundation, the implication was that, that uh, they're undergoing a, a strategy discussion right now. Uh, and uh, so if, if nothing else, um, I, I, I predict that it's going to be robust, if, if not uh, hugely growing over the next decades. I would, uh, I would strongly agree with that. And I, I, so my, my answer, like Chris's to your question, is, is yes. And I think there are some great examples, Michelle Shang and others in the audience, of how exciting these possibilities are. And I would just add that I think, particularly in the UCSF environment, it's a great opportunity um, for young scientists and investigators who want to bridge between laboratory science, the clinical dimension, the epidemiology, and the policy. I think there's fantastic opportunities for people with the uh, with the skills and aptitude to have a good knowledge of malaria from the molecule and the gene through to some of the major policy debates in southern Africa and to translate between those spheres and join those things together. I think it's a very rewarding, a very rewarding area. Over here and then next here. Carol Gross, UCSF. Uh, I just wonder if um, some of you could comment on what you think the a good balance would be between the specific disease eradication, TB, malaria, AIDS, and general public health measures? Well, the, um, if I understand the question right, um, we, we, uh, we live in an era where we've, we've, we've just come through a decade of dramatic growth in investment in global health by the wealthy countries of the world. We've just come through a kind of golden age of investment in global health. And AIDS, TB, and malaria, the three foci of the Global Fund, have taken the lion's share of those investments. And there's much debate and controversy around whether that is the right balance. And the Obama administration inherited from the Bush administration a foreign assistance program which was a huge amount of HIV with some malaria bolted on the side and almost nothing else. And on, almost on day one, the Obama administration concluded that this was not a balanced portfolio in global health, and they're working hard to create a balanced portfolio in global health. So maternal health, the health of the newborn, health systems, neglected tropical diseases, a variety of other subjects are rising in the agenda. And I think what we can expect is a more balance between AIDS, TB, and malaria and those other priority global health agendas. I think that's correct. The challenge is not to 
not to diminish the incredibly successful efforts in AIDS, TB, and malaria in order to fund these new and undoubtedly important other agendas. And doing that in the current financial climate is incredibly challenging. And it brings me back to this spending, spending smarter idea. Uh, I think it's really a very challenging issue. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm Rich Losick. Henry Bourne's question touched on something that I uh, care a lot about, which I teach undergraduates at Harvard, and I sense a tremendous interest in the subject of global health. But, but this is an interest that we don't address uh, very well. M most of our graduates go on to medical school or, God forbid, do nano trading on Wall Street. <laughs> and, and we have uh, a, a, a terrific school of public health with uh, a lot of expertise. So uh, at, um, at Barry Bloom, our former dean, and I are trying to address this with, uh, with a new course. But, but if my, what I sense at Harvard is true at other undergraduate institutions, I think there's fertile ground for recruiting young people in, into this intersection of, of science and policy and so forth. That's right. We just uh, completed a survey of North American universities. There are now 280 universities which have global health programs. And some 80 of them are very well developed programs. And the interest and excitement in students, residents, postdoctoral fellows and young faculty is, is unprecedented. We have to catch the crest of this wave. Yes, you're quite right. Yes. Hi, James Sabri, Genentech. Question for Joe about, I was fascinated by this dormant state that you alluded to. Um, and I don't know how to really reconcile that with Phil's data on the fact that you don't get reinfection from the same parasite often after ACTs. Can you talk a little bit more about uh, the biology of that and, and, and how to reconcile that with the epidemiologic data? Well, I wish we knew more about the biology of that. That's, that's ongoing research. Uh, it, the phenomena has been documented now, and what's underlying it is totally unknown. But it could, um, it could help to explain some of the data in, in which we are seeing not treatment failures per se, but the time to cure which is longer, and that you could imagine that dormancy or some uh, static state of the parasite has something to do with this, that instead of being killed uh, in 24 hours, now it's taking 100 hours or whatever the number is up to now in the, um, in the um, Cambodia region, that dormancy might have something to do with this delay. And that, that also might be behind some of what is now being called real treatment failures. Well, and also, reconciling is not difficult. Those were artemisinin and combination therapies. Yeah. And so the, the basis of ACT is you have a second drug to mop up the parasites, perhaps the dormant parasites, that have, have not been eradicated. I'm sorry? That's right, yeah. But uh, importantly, the, 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 the artemisinin-based combination therapy is kind of uh, ill-conceived the way we think about treating other infections in that the second drug is, it has a much longer half-life than the first drug. Uh, that works okay in a place like Southeast Asia where there aren't many reinfections in a short period of time. But in a place like Sub-Saharan Africa, we're really asking for resistance to those partner drugs. We're already seeing it with some of them. Uh, and so we, both, we have problems with both components of, of the regimen, which is real concern. We'll have one last question back there. Hi, my name is Josh Kane. I'm a graduate student here at UCSF. And it seems like there's a lot of effort to understand the molecular physiology of the infection of the plasmodium uh, agent in the human host. But is any research being undertaken uh, to understand the infection and physiology of the interaction between plasmodium and its uh, mosquito vector? Sure. I don't know that there's anybody at the table uh, who's doing a lot of that. But for example, um, there's a really interesting vaccine candidate that came out of that, some of that kind of research by uh, a young faculty at Johns Hopkins um, who has found a glycoprotein on the mosquito midgut surface, antibodies against which generated in the mammalian host and brought along with the blood meal can then block progression of the, of the sexual stages of the life cycle through the mosquito. And the nice thing is it's not a malaria uh, molecule, so the malaria parasite might be less likely or less quick to evolve resistance to it. Okay. 
Could, could I just quickly mention, since I don't think it's been mentioned once, that in terms of the research agenda, Plasmodium vivax is now right up there with Plasmodium falciparum. And outside Africa, most malaria is vivax, not falciparum. And vivax has been a seriously neglected member of the human Plasmodium family. And there is an enormous amount of research to be done on host-parasite interactions in vivax and parasite-mosquito interactions in, in vivax as well. Well, uh, time is up. I just uh, want to thank Chris for his wonderful talk and for Joe, uh, Richard. Richard, and Phil for their wonderful participation. Thank you, the audience, for your participation.